Hello, thank you very much for watching this webinar on the preparation of the mayor for covering. This is a talk that I gave recently at the National Stud and TBA meeting uh, in Wiltshire, and I hope you find it uh, interesting. So I'm gonna talk about the pre-breeding requirements for the thoroughbred mayor, and then go on to talk about the preparation of the mayor at the beginning of the season, the individual cycle prior to the mayor being covered, and then finally the cover. So for pre-breeding requirements, these are mostly set out in the HBLB codes of practice. It's worth downloading these and having a look uh, if you haven't already. Um, they set out pretty well the testing schedules for the individual mare. They also go through a number of different diseases that thoroughbred mares may be affected uh, by uh, and talks about the diagnosis and treatment and so on of these various diseases. I'm going to focus on the diseases that we, we actually test for during the season. Uh, and you can see here on the slide that we take bloods for equine viral arteritis and equine infectious anemia. And then we take uh, clitoral swabs and cervical swabs for CEM, Klebsiella and Pseudomonas. And how and when we take those bloods and swabs is really set out in the HBLB codes of practice. And so as an example below for the clitoral and cervical swabs, uh, the mares are categorized into low and high risk. So a high risk mare is a mare that's been outside uh, the UK, France, Germany, Ireland and Italy, uh, or has been exposed to one of these diseases in a uh, previous year. And so if she's a high risk mare, she requires two clitoral swabs before going to the stallion and an endometrial swab on each uh, season before she goes to the stallion. A low risk mare will only require one clitoral swab after January the 1st, and this endometrial swab, uh, single endometrial swab prior to going to the stallion. What I find useful is to go on to the Newmarket Stud Farmers Association website. They give a pretty good overview of the testing schedules for the mare in an individual season. And so you can see here, as I said above, the high risk mares requiring two negative clitoral swabs after January the 1st and an endometrial swab on each subsequent uh, cycle before they're covered, and the low-risk mares requiring one clitoral swab and one negative uh, endometrial swab. And you can see here as well the testing for equine viral arteritis. Um, they will, um, it's slightly different categorization between high and low risk. If they've been outside of the UK or Ireland, they will require additional testing. So if they've been in the UK, they require one negative um, blood sample taken after January the 1st. And if they've been outside the UK or Ireland, then they'll require a blood sample taken within uh, 28 days of arrival in the UK, and then a blood sample taken uh, 14 days after arrival in the country. And for equine infectious anemia, it's slightly different. Uh, for low risk mares that have been within the UK and Ireland, then they only require a, a blood sample after January the 1st, one blood sample after January the 1st. And for mares that have been outside the UK and Ireland, then they require a blood within 14 days of arrival in the country and uh, after 14 days uh, within the country. A couple of other things to note from this slide is that if you look at the uh, equine infectious anemia section, that mares coming from Germany or Italy also require the foals, if the mares have got foals at foot, to have a, a blood sample taken. And it's quite interesting at the beginning, uh, at the top there, it talks about not travelling mares that are not of the same disease status. So if a mare is travelling from southern Europe with um, uh, sport horse mares that haven't been under a similar testing schedule, then you should be aware of that and they shouldn't be travelled together. So this is just a note to remind me to talk about the uh, EquiBioSafe app. It's a really useful app that's been developed in the uh, last few years. Uh, and there you can um, work through um, mares or stallions to work out if they're high or low risk. Um, and it also has all the uh, information from the codes of practice on there. And then also there's a vaccine calculator, which can be quite useful as well uh, if you need to work out your influenza vaccinations. So I thought I would just talk through the swabbing process. I won't show you a picture of me taking your blood, but I thought just out of interest, I'd go through the swabbing process. On the left hand side is a picture uh, of taking a clitoral swab. 
and you can see the swabs um, in the lower part of the picture. The swab is just about to take um, from the uh, clitoral fossa, which is just a, a broad recess at the lower part of the clitoris. And at the top of the clitoris there, you can see the uh, clitoral sinus, which is a three uh, pronged recess, which we swab from also. On the right hand side of the screen is the picture down a speculum of Omer's cervix. And you, um, I would grade this cervix about a one to two uh, out of three. The mare just looks like she's just beginning to come into season. It's pink, it's moist, uh, but it hasn't fully um, relaxed yet. And we'll take the swab from this cervix using the uh, swab in the middle of the screen. This is a double guarded uterine swab, and this has two sheaths, and which means the swab is protected on the way into the uh, taking the um, swab from the cervix and is protected on the way out from any contamination. So we reduce the risk of getting contaminants. So I thought it would be good to focus on the individual diseases so that um, to give an understanding of why we're taking the different swabs and bloods. So contagious equine metritis, this is caused by a bacteria, uh, Taylorella equigenitalis. Um, and it causes uh, subfertility. And um, during the season when they first discovered it, they found it very difficult to get mares in foal. And they had a number of mares with a, with a sort of purulent vaginal discharge. And they found it very difficult to work out exactly what was causing it. And that's because the, um, the, the bacteria is quite difficult to grow. It grows in microaerophilic conditions. So very uh, low oxygen uh, tension conditions. Uh, and also it takes quite a long time to grow. So it might take two or three do days to show on an agar plate, by which time you may have an overgrowth of a lot of other uh, bacteria. So um, uh, having discovered what it is, uh, we now have a lot of testing procedures in place to try and avoid it, because as it says, it is very contagious if a stallion has it, he'll pass it on to 100% of the mare that he, uh, mares that he covers. And then about 20% of those mares will go on to carry the, uh, the bacteria going forward. And so you can see how uh, difficult it can be uh, to, to, to manage. And contagious equimetritis is really the reason we do a lot of things we do around the, uh, around the stocks. And that'll include um, putting gloves on to hold tails, making sure we use disposable equipment uh, uh, between mares where we can, uh, and, and so on. Uh, it's occasionally seen in the UK, um, normally in uh, Im imported ho uh, horses, uh, and it's endemic in, um, in some non-thoroughbred populations uh, in Europe. So there's a picture of a, a vaginal discharge from a mare, and you can see here on the right-hand side, that is the actual organism growing on an agar plate, and that's a chocolate blood agar. So again, it requires specific plates uh, to, to grow the organism. I thought I'd talk briefly about Pseudomonas and Klebitsiella. Uh, these are opportunistic organisms that are widespread in the environment. Um, they can be associated with previous antibiotic or antiseptic treatments. And you can imagine a situation where uh, you're using antiseptics on the vulva of the mare, you kill the normal flora of bacteria on the vulva, and then you get an overgrowth of uh, Klebsiella or Pseudomonas. And the same applies for antibiotics, where you use antibiotics, kill the normal flora, and then end up with an overgrowth of, uh, of one of these bacteria. And in the Newmarket Stud Farmers Association, I put an excerpt at the bottom of this slide, uh, which um, says that you need to take additional swabs from mares where they've had a lot of antibiotic treatment post foaling And this is because there's an increased risk of having uh, these Pseudomonas or Klebsiella uh, bacteria present. Um, Pseudomonas can develop significant antibiotic resistance and can be quite hard to treat. Um, Klebsiella, um, again, is less commonly multi-resistant, but there are some case reports of multi-resistant strains. Klebsiella, you can actually capsule type Klebsiella to find uh, uh, different strains of the Klebsiella. So there's capsule type one, two, and five, and they're the significant ones. If you get any other capsule type, so capsule type seven, it's not considered significant, and you can actually breed the mare with a Klebsiella pneumonia that's capsule type seven, but not of one, two, and, and five. Treatment uh, involves really normally waiting for a, um, a sensitivity pattern to find out which um, antibiotics your 
the organism uh, is sensitive to and thoroughly cleaning the clitoris and then applying uh, the appropriate antibiotic to it. We're trying to get away from the widespread use of antibiotics at the moment, so more and more we're using fecal broths, so thorough cleaning of the clitoris and then using fecal broths to try and repopulate the area with uh, normal flora of, um, uh, of bacteria and displacing the pseudomonas and the, uh, the Klebsiella. Equine viral arteritis, uh, caused by equine viral arteritis virus. Um, it causes a, 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 a arteritis, which is inflammation within the arteries. You can imagine when you get inflammation in the arteries, they become leaky. And so you get swelling around the eyes, swollen legs, swelling, swelling around the, the genitalia. Um, it's transmitted by uh, breeding. It's also there's a can be transmitted by a respiratory route and can also be transmitted via equipment between uh, between the horses. It's a really interesting virus in that it is uh, testosterone dependent. And as such, the uh, mare, if she gets the disease, she has it and is able to clear the disease. But because the stallion has testosterone, he's able to maintain the um, the, the disease and can go on to be a, a long term carrier of the disease. So the treatment for equine viral arteritis is actually castration and then the stallion doesn't produce testosterone anymore and then it's unable to maintain the virus, um, maintain the virus. So there is a vaccination available for equine viral arteritis and it's very common for stallions in the UK to be vaccinated. Um, something to note is to make sure that the stallions are kept up uh, with the vaccination program because it's not clear um, uh, from taking blood samples, whether that's due to vaccination or due to um, uh, due to infection. So we need a negative blood sample prior to them being vaccinated and then a regular vaccination thereafter to make sure that they don't carry the disease. It's endemic in non-thoroughbred Europe and was last seen in the UK in, in 2010. So these are the sort of clinical signs, uh, swollen conjunctiva, and swelling around the testicles and limbs uh, and sort of generalized edema. So equine infectious anemia, it does what it says again, it causes an anemia. So it causes a breakdown of red blood cells and also causes a suppression of uh, red blood cell production in the bone marrow. It's transmitted by biting flies. So, um, and anything that transmits blood uh, between the horses. So blood products that are, uh, that are used in horses, any equipment that's used between horses and uh, potentially also from mare to foal. Uh, it causes um, uh, depression, uh, can cause hemorrhage and can cause weight loss and can cause a very uh, severe disease. Um, it's a notifiable disease. Uh, um, uh, equine infectious anemia, equine viral arteritis and CEM are all notifiable diseases and this means that if we know about the disease then we have to inform the APHA, they'll set up a quarantine program and um, in the case of EIA because it's such a severe disease and because there's no treatment for it uh, and because it can be spread around uh, with biting flies then there's a compulsory slaughter program in place for this uh, specific uh, disease. Um, there is no vaccination available for equine infectious anemia. There have been some outbreaks in the UK. One widespread case in Ireland in 2006 was caused by the importing of um, blood products or plasma from, uh, from Italy uh, that uh, contained the, the, the virus. Um, and then more recently in the UK, there was outbreaks in uh, 2010 and 2012. 12. So you can see on the picture on the right there, there's a picture of the distribution in Europe in uh, 2010. And you can see uh, that there was both the case in Northumberland and Devon uh, in that year. I thought I would just talk about EHV uh, because some studs are increasingly asking for EHV testing prior to horses coming to their stud. And this is because there was a, um, a perceived increase in the amount of EHV uh, circulating in the last few years. 
There's five types of EHV. The one we're most interested in probably is EHV1. This causes, uh, uh, potentially causes abortion storms, uh, causes res uh, respiratory signs, and can also cause severe neurologic signs. There's EHV3, which we'll talk about a bit later on, which causes the spots around the vulva and also on the stallion's penis. And then there's EHV4, which can cause mild respiratory signs and is also a sporadic cause of abortion. The abortion most commonly occurs at greater than eight months. Um, the horse is usually abort uh, after two weeks to two months after they've been exposed to the virus. Um, and the important thing to understand about EHV is that the majority of young stock are exposed to the, uh, to the virus. So where you have um, a number of yearlings together that have snotty noses and filled legs, if you take swabs off a number of them, which I have done in the past, you'll find a number of them come up, for, uh, uh, come up with um, uh, EHV uh, positive. And the reason it's important to know that is that uh, twofold, really. One is just to be very aware that if EHV is circulating in the young stock, then they shouldn't be anywhere near the mares. So keeping the young stock and the mares separated uh, in a stud farm environment. And then also, once a horse has been exposed to EHV, it's an extraordinary virus that can remain latent in the, in the lymph nodes of the horse. And then at some time later, due to some stressor, transport or whatever it is, it can then uh, reappear within the horse. So uh, a mare may be um, uh, in a field, in a settled herd, and for no apparent reason um, that you don't know about for some sort of stressor, causes this EHV to reoccur in the mare and causes an abortion, which can then trigger an abortion storm potentially. So it's just a feature of EHV that uh, is worthwhile uh, being aware of. So I'm now going to talk about my approach to uh, preparing the mare at the beginning of the season. I've put in big yellow uh, uh, letters there, know the mare. Um, and I think this is probably the most important factor in, um, in getting good uh, fertility rates. So that's for each individual mare, getting a history of the mare. How old is she? Is she a maiden mare? Is she a barren mare? Has she had any pregnancy loss in the past or recently? Uh, if she's lost uh, her pregnancy within the last uh, two to four months, then she may be still producing a hormone pregnant mare, serum gonadotrophin. And this can um, affect the mare's fertility going forward. Uh, and so that's a, blood, uh, a test, a blood test we can do if we know that the mare has lost her pregnancy uh, recently. Um, uh, what previous treatments has the mare had? Has she had uh, antibiotics? How many cycles was she covered on? Was she treated on each of those individual cycles? Has she had any other treatments that would be um, interesting or may affect the mare going forward? So having got a decent history, then we look at the condition of the mare um, the, and the general health of the mare. Has she got any diseases that may affect uh, uh, her fertility rate? Has she got uh, Cushing's, for instance? Has she uh, had uh, laminitis in the past um, uh, and, and so on? Any disease that may affect um, the, uh, her, her fertility. And then we go, I go on to examine the, uh, the actual mare and her reproductive so when I'm looking at the reproductive tract, I'll go through all the different uh, parts of the reproductive tract. Um, so, for instance, we'll start with the ovaries. Look at the ovaries. Does um, she have any uh, anovulatory follicles in the ovary? Are the ovaries uh, a normal size? Um, then look at the uterus. Does she have any cysts within the uterus? Is there any fluid in the uterus? Have a good look at the mare's cervix. Are there any tears uh, in, the, in the cervix? Uh, some older mares may have very tight fibrotic cervixes. Uh, and it's useful to know that before you start breeding. Um, and then have a look at the mare's vulva and particularly the mare's vulval conformation to see if um, that she has a good seal there. Here are some examples. So we can see on the left hand side, uh, there's a mare with a young mare with good vulval conformation. And on the right hand side uh, is an older mare with uh, poor vulval conformation. You can see the sunken rectum and the sloping forward sort of nature of the vulva. And this conformation will predispose the mare to sucking in air, causing a, a pneuma vagina. Um, this may also suck in uh, detritus or bacteria, which will make the mare uh, difficult to, to get in foal. The other reason that they're difficult to get in foal is because this pneuma vagina caused by poor vulval conformation will inhibit um, this valve-like effect 
that the the cervix the vagina and the um, the vulva has uh, for when mare is being cleared from the uterus so fluid can be cleared from the uterus in one of two ways it can either be absorbed from the uterus via the lymphatics or otherwise it uh, will leave via the cervix and uh, through the um, the caudal reproductive tract and you can see if the mare's uh, sucked in air and she has a pneumo vagina there then this valve like effect doesn't really work and the uh, the fluid will remain in the uterus having a good look at the cervix this is a, a what i would say is a, a a grade three cervix nice relaxed uh, cervix and i'll have a visual examination of the cervix and also manually palpate the cervix in some mares to make sure that there's no tears or damage to so now I'm just going to run through a few scans uh, of mares early in the season just to uh, demonstrate some of the things that we might uh, see. This is a, a uterine cyst. Cysts of this size won't impact uh, the breeding um, and fertility rate of the mare. Um, but if there are extensive cysts throughout the uterus, then it may affect the mare. And it's really just a sign of uh, sort of uh, age related uh, degenerative changes within the uterus. This is a picture that you hate to see. This is actually, um, you might see this with a mare with a, a pyometra. This is actually a mare with a, a ur urine within the uterus. After the mare is foaled, the uterus is very heavy and pulls the whole reproductive tract forward. And so the urine coming out of the urethra might um, fall back into the uterus. And that's what's happened in this case. And majority of these can be uh, addressed by uh, cleaning the mare up and uterine lavage uh, and occasionally they may require surgery to uh, help correct this issue if it's a persistent. This is a short video showing a mare with one large ovary on the right hand side and a small ovary on the on the, on the left and you can just about see here there was a, an abnormal mass within the uterus uh, and this was a mare with a granulosa cell tumour, which was identified in early season. The mare was also showing signs of stallion-like uh, behaviour, which also um, uh, gave us an idea of what was going on. And we can take a blood to help our diagnosis of this. Um, this is a picture of a marble in the uterus of mares. These mares are not going in foal. I've um, uh, seen a mare that had been bred a few times before, and she, um, when we scanned her, we found this marble in her uterus. And just another thing to look out for uh, before the mares are bred. Uh, here is a picture of a hematoma within the broad ligament. Uh, older mares, when they come to foal, can have um, bleeds within the broad ligament, um, sometimes very uh, serious bleeds. In this case, um, this is a year after the, uh, the, the bleed occurred and there's an organized mass which uh, is well within the broad ligament and is not going to affect uh, the mare breeding this year. Uh, this you can see at the, the front edge of the uterus on the left hand side there's a small mass within the left horn of the uterus and this was in fact a leiomyoma so a tumour within the uterus. This was successfully removed and the, and the mare went on um, to breed okay during the subsequent season. Um, this chart just shows you what to expect when we're breeding mares and this was some data from uh, Twink Allen and Sandra Wilshire and this was over uh, over a thousand Easter cycles and you can see for young mares you should be expecting about a 70% uh, pregnancy rate per cycle and then for older mares so the 14 to 18 mares it drops to about 60% and over 18 years old, it drops to about 50% uh, pregnancy rate per cycle. And I think that's about a fair representation of what we should, uh, should be uh, expecting. So for certain mares where I know they've had fertility issues in the past, we can do some further investigation. So we've got the decent breeding history. We've done a breeding examination, as I described. We do ultrasound examination to see if we can see abnormalities within the uterus. And then we may also biopsy the uterus. We may also put a camera in the uterus, which is hysteroscopy. And then in some cases, we'll do laparoscopy. So putting a camera into the side of the mare uh, to have a look at the, um, the ovary and the oviduct, um, which I'll explain shortly. 
So uterine biopsy, you can see that green spot there is where we take a uterine biopsy from. Uh, the picture on the top on the right hand side is what we're hoping for. Nice, healthy uh, uterine tissue. And then if we get a picture like uh, on the on the bottom right, then it's a bit disappointing and we wonder whether it's uh, the right thing to do to be breeding the mare. And this is the crypts are not um, of good quality. There's uh, um, um, dilated lymphatics uh, at the bottom of the slide there. And there's a lot of fibrous tissue within the uh, within the uterine lining. And so we may consider not breeding this uh, mare going forward. Hysteroscopy, so this picture on the left hand side is right up the tip of the right horn and right in the middle of the screen you can just about see the oviductal papillae. This is where the uh, developing embryo will drop into the uterus at about five and a half days uh, after the mare has ovulated. Uh, and on the right hand side is a picture of us doing uh, laser surgery on some uh, endometrial cysts. This is a picture uh, courtesy of Hugh Neal and uh, this is uh, performing laparoscopy on the mare. In some cases where you've looked for all the other problems and you've, you've been through issues within the uterus, you've looked at the uh, for issues on the ovary uh, and you've bred the mare a number of times and you haven't seen significant problems, the issue may be within the oviduct and it may be caused by a blockage in the oviduct. And in these cases, uh, we can you do this laparoscopy to visualize the oviduct and put a prostaglandin gel on the oviduct, which causes a relaxation of the oviduct and allows the embryo to uh, to pass into the into the uterus. So that's an interesting technique for use in some mares where we've ruled out a number of the other uh, issues. Finally, I thought I'd just talk about some treatments that we might use in subfertile mares. The first one is acetylcysteine. Um, there have been quite a few papers uh, recently about biofilm production within a mare's uterus. This is where um, a number of bacteria uh, together can form a film and they'll live in this film and can make it much harder for treatments to get to the actual bacteria. So we use acetylcysteine, which is a mucolytic, to break down the biofilm and then whatever treatment we're using can get directly to the bacteria. Another one is TRIS-EDTA, which can help potentiate the use of uh, antibiotics within the uterus. Um, the next one is plasma, where this can help uh, improve the immunity within the, in the uterus. Um, and a couple more just at the end there, GNRH agonists. I'll occasionally use these in subfertile mares. This is given at 10 days post ovulation. And there's a paper showing that uh, this has a, a positive effect on fertility, uh, fertility rates. And then finally, steroids in mares that have a, a excessive inflammatory response, either pre-cover or post-cover, uh, it can be useful to give steroids to dampen down that, uh, that inflammatory response. Uh, and it's been shown to have a, a, a positive effect in certain mares. So I'm now going to go on to talk about the individual cycle prior to the mare being covered and how we manage that. So this is the picture of the reproductive cycle. I think it's really under, you know, useful to have an understanding of the, the, the cycle. Uh, it's a complex graph, but I think it uh, adds a lot of interest uh, if you have an understanding of exactly what all the hormones are doing uh, during, the, during the cycle. I've tried to draw on here what's going on in the ovaries at the same time. So you can see um, between the two ovulations here, there's about 21 days. During that time, on the right hand side of the, uh, the picture, you can see a um, large dominant follicle that's in pink there. The large dominant follicle will ovulate and form the early corpus luteum that's in blue. And you can see the uh, becomes more organized and that large uh, corpus luteum produces progesterone. And that progesterone does everything to keep the mare out of season. So it causes uh, amazing behavioral changes of uh, kicking and squealing and so on at the, the stallion. Uh, and also causes changes within the reproductive tract. So it causes uh, the uterus to tighten up. There'll be no edema within the uterus. The cervix will be tight and so on. So it's pretty extraordinary hormone. And that is in nanograms per mil. So even tiny amounts of this hormone uh, can do that. And then at about uh, 12 to 14 days, the mare produces her own prostaglandins, 
which causes the, the lysis or the breakdown of this corpus luteum. And then um, a dominant follicle is uh, allowed to appear. So you can see throughout the uh, diestrus, where the mare is not in season, these waves of follicles occur. And then when the progesterone comes down, it, uh, a, a dominant follicle is allowed to be selected and you get estrogen production by this uh, dominant follicle. When the mare is close to ovulating, there's a surge of a hormone LH, and that is luteinizing hormone, and that causes this uh, dominant follicle to ovulate, and the process starts again. And the only hormone that I haven't mentioned there is FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, and this occurs in waves, and this uh, cr uh, creates these waves of, uh, of, of follicles. I thought it would be interesting just to show a few pictures of what we're seeing on the ultrasound scanner at different stages in the cycle. So on the bottom of the screen on the left hand side here, this is a picture of a uterus. At the uh, top of the screen is the uterus and that thin narrow white line is the center of the uterus. And there's no edema pattern within the uterus and the uterus is essentially sort of narrow and tight. And on the right hand side is a picture of the cervix, uh, again, a tight looking cervix. And this is what we'll see on the ovary. On the right hand side is a, a early corpus luteum, uh, which the center is filled with blood. You can call it the corpus hemorrhagicum as well. This becomes more and more organized as the, uh, the CL ages and through that diestrous period. And then in early, C, uh, uh, early estrus, you have the, um, the dominant follicle being selected there on the left hand side. The mare will be well in season, showing all those signs of being in season, being um, uh, receptive to the stallion, uh, clitoral winking, uh, and so on. And you can see in the middle picture there, that's the, uh, the uterus with an edema pattern in it, where you can see these edematous folds within the, in the uterus. And then coming up close to uh, the point of ovulation, this large dominant follicle will be about uh, 45 millimeters uh, wide and you can see it started to become misshapen and also there's started to form a point towards the ovulation fossa there. And at that time when we've got a large dominant follicle we may use um, uh, ovulating agents to uh, assist the mare ovulating and to make sure that ovulation occurs. There's obviously a significant expense in taking the mare to be uh, covered and also uh, there's um, we try and reduce the pressure on the stallions as well by using these ovulating agents so we may use Corilon this is in fact a human chorionic gonadotrophin and this mimics the effects of LH so the LH uh, surge that naturally occurs in the mare we can produce this effect using hormones and uh, cause the mare to ovulate there's also oviplant, which uh, is a desilorelin, which is a gonadotrophin releasing hormone. Uh, this causes, this gonadotrophin releasing hormone, causes the release of LH and FSH in the body. So it's one stage higher. Um, and so we can use oviplant, or we can also use an injectable desilorelin uh, as well um, to cause ovulations. This is just a note about uh, the um, anovulatory follicles. These are a frustrating occurrence. You've done everything, you've got the mare lined up, you've sent her for cover, and then the mare doesn't ovulate. And this is a sort of typical appearance of an anovulatory follicle. Um, and they can become quite large. They can become 60 or 70 millimeters uh, wide. Uh, and my advice for uh, dealing with anovulatory follicles is to be patient. Wait until the mare is uh, 10 days uh, after the time you might have expected uh, her to ovulate or even up to 14 even up to two weeks before you give her a, a prostaglandin um, and that gives you the best possible chance of her coming back into uh, back into season. Folding mares and fold heat just a couple of comments about uh, fold heat I'll always wait till after 10 days if I'm going to breed a mare on fold heat uh, everything has to be really perfect uh, for me to want to breed a mare on uh, on fall heat because the uh, overall the pregnancy rates on fall heat are less than they would be on a on a normal cycle as it were. 
the fold heat it runs from about seven to uh, to 10, 11 days. And so not all mares are gonna be able to be bred uh, on fold heat. If we are gonna breed a mare on fold heat, it's really important to examine the mare very thoroughly uh, post folding to make sure there's no bruising or damage to the cervix, to make sure that the mare has involuted really well and to make sure she doesn't have any fluid in her uterus. And these mares are caslics if they need it uh, quite early post foaling to make sure it gives the mare the best opportunity to do that. Just a note on retained uh, placentas. There was a paper out of Japan uh, in the last few years that showed for every hour after two hours that the mare retains her placenta. She has reduced uh, a chance of going in foal on her uh, on her foal heat and in fact on the subsequent heat already uh, subsequent heat as well. So if a mare has retained her placenta for over two hours, then she certainly wouldn't be a candidate for a full heat cover. So finally, I'm just going to talk briefly about the cover. When you're taking the mare to stud, you'll be presented with or you'll have to have had to fill in one of these forms. And it just makes sure that everything, all the pre-reading requirements that we talked about have been fulfilled. So has she had a negative clitoral swab taken pro, uh, after January the 1st? Has she had a negative endometrial swab taken after January the 1st? Uh, ha has she had a negative EVA blood? Has she had a negative EIA blood? And any other uh, additional testing requirements for individual studs, uh, stud farms, such as nasal swabs, VHB will come on this form. And then you'll also need to sign to say that the mare hasn't been in contact with or been exposed to any cases of strangles, EHV, or other uh, relevant contagious diseases uh, prior to her uh, coming to the, to the stallion stud. It's worth informing the stud if there's any other um, uh, um, things to note uh, before she goes to the, uh, to the stallion. Is she a difficult mare? Is she a difficult mare in terms of uh, breeding? And it's just useful to know uh, we may consider using extenders if she's been uh, particularly difficult. And is she a difficult mare herself? So is she a young maiden mare who uh, is always uh, been very difficult, is not showing well to the teaser and may need sedating? Um, has she had any reproductive surgery previously? Does she have any urethra extensions? Has she had any previous damage to the cervix? It's all useful things to know so we can manage the mare well uh, in the breeding shed. Uh, a note, as I said, I would talk about coital exanthema. This is EHV3. This causes the spots, essentially. And you can see here on the right hand side is a picture of what EHV3 looks like uh, in the mare. And if you suspect it at all, uh, you must let the stallion uh, owners know. So because it will cause a similar thing on the stallion's penis, as you can see on the left here, and this will cause the stallion to be off games, as it were, for two to three weeks. And so it's important to uh, to try and avoid this being spread. And here's some pictures in the covering shed. Um, you can see the mare being teased initially. Uh, and then the picture on the right, the mare is restrained with a twitch, with a, uh, a bridle on and also padded boots on as well to try and avoid any uh, damage to the, to the stallion. Um, this is what we're trying to avoid. Uh, the stallion being uh, kicked in the testicles, essentially, uh, and everything we do in the covering shed really is to tr uh, hoping to try and avoid this. And then finally, this is uh, uh, to show what happens when the uh, semen gets inside the mare. It comes up into the oviduct, and this is the the, the egg is fertilized. The egg uh, come is fertilized in the within the oviduct, and then at about five and a half days, the um, embryo drops into the uterus and so we have a two to three days after the mare is ovulated in order to get the uterus into the best possible state uh, for the developing embryo to, to come into the uterus. Semen extender, I think over the last five uh, years there's been an increasing amount of use of its semen extender. Um, it does it has a number of things that it does. Some mares are uh, um, are uh, sensitive to uh, dead sperm and also uh, the seminal plasma and it can dilute the seminal plasma and this can cause less of a reaction in the mare and it provides a number of things that may support uh, 
the, the, the sperm as well, uh, glucose and, and, and proteins and such, and also contains, uh, some of them will contain antibiotics as well, which in difficult mares uh, can, be, can be of benefit. This is a picture at the National Stud, because it was for a National Stud talk uh, of uh, three happy looking mares uh, wandering away uh, there. Um, and that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much for, for watching. Uh, if we can be of any help with any of the uh, issues uh, brought up in the talk, then please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, and you can contact us through the website at www.pinkamequine.com. Thank you very much.